Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Renee Eveland, and I will be your host for this NASA Technology Transfer Program webinar on NASA's nanowire glass switch for radio frequency applications. Our presenter today is Dr. James Nessel. Dr. James Nessel is the chief of the Advanced High Frequency Branch and co-inventor of the nanoionic based radio frequency switch. He received his bachelor's and master's degrees in electrical engineering from Arizona State University in the areas of electromagnetics and solid state devices and went on to obtain his PhD in electrical engineering from the University of Akron with a focus on antenna arraying and remote sensing. Since 2004, he has worked at NASA Glenn Research Center where his primary fields of research include advanced antenna design concepts, ground-based antenna arrays, phased array technologies, and KA band atmospheric propagation studies. Following James's presentation, I will be giving a short presentation on how NASA licenses technology to outside organizations. Before we get started, I'd like to point out that your microphones will be muted throughout this presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them into the chat box in the lower right corner of your screen, and we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end. And now James will present on NASA's nanowire glass switch for radio frequency applications. Okay, thank you, Renee. And uh, thanks to everyone who's um, here today to hear about this technology. Um, and thank you for the, the introduction. So I will just go ahead and, and jump right into the, uh, the technology area that we'll be talking about here today. Uh, I'll start with uh, the background, some background and, and what, what kind of motivated this work. Um, so early on in my career, uh, you know, in the early to mid 2000s, um, you know, MEMS based devices were, uh, you know, really uh, coming into um, fruition as a technology uh, that could be used, uh, you know, in our applications and in RF applications. Um, to, you know, potentially uh, improve upon and replace uh, solid state uh, RF based uh, switching devices. And so uh, we had uh, internally at, at the Glenn Research Center, um, a solicitation for uh, independent research and, and development efforts uh, that were really looking at high risk, uh, high reward, uh, game changing technologies. And so um, we had funding for a couple years uh, to investigate this technology as one that could potentially uh, compete uh, and outperform in some ways uh, the, the MEMS-based approaches as well as the solid-state-based approaches. And so as part of this work, we really focused on the switching technology because the, the switches are really, you know, a fundamental building block. Uh, for uh, tunable or reconfigurable RF devices. And so, you know, based on the research I was conducting at the time, uh, in, in the, uh, at that time, the antenna and optical systems branch, um, my work was really focused on uh, antenna designs and, and in particular, uh, reconfigurable antennas and phased array antennas. And so, um, the application we were really searching for, as I mentioned, was, was looking to create a state-of-the-art, uh, a new type of state-of-the-art switch uh, that could really potentially combine a lot of the benefits of both MEMS-based approaches and solid-state-based approaches. Um, and so, you know, the, as I mentioned, those were the kind of the technologies we were uh, competing or comparing against. And, and this approach that I'll describe here in, in the presentation today uh, focuses on on you know where we saw the promise in terms of uh, you know combining the advantages of the electronic kind of more electronic based solid state based switches uh, uh, with the high performance of the physical connections that these mechanical MEMS based switches provide. And so you know as, as some examples here you can see in the upper right hand corner you know one of the applications we were looking at um, uh, in terms of phase shifter technologies had to do with um, discrete uh, line uh, discrete phase shifters um, where we have switch line delays where we can switch between different delay lengths uh, for our rf signal 
in order to adjust the phase of, of that particular antenna element, for example, and allow for electronic beam steering in, in phased array antenna applications. Uh, the other area that you know we were also focused in had to do with the reconfigurable antennas. So the idea here being incorporating switchable or switching technologies into antenna designs where you could, for example, create uh, multi-band type antennas by connecting, you know, different aspects of physically connecting different aspects of um, of an antenna element to adjust the frequency of operation. Um, could also be used, for example, for switching between different polarization approaches in a single antenna design. So we really saw this as kind of, as I mentioned, a fundamental building block that allows for this tunability or reconfigurability um, as they pertained to antenna technologies. Um, so just a bit to explain into kind of the theory of, of how this switch functions. Um, it's really based in this area um, uh, called nanoionics. And so this nanoionics um, research really, you know, grew out of a lot of work that was going on at Arizona State University, my alma mater at the time. And what they were looking at were applications for um, uh, uh, memory technology, so random access memory technologies. And so effectively, the way the, the theory behind the operation of this switch is that you really you start with a, a base glass structure. Uh, the base glass um, is formed out of one of the chalcogens, um, which is really the, the column of the periodic table um, headed by oxygen, for example. Um, and you use that chalcogenide uh, base compound as um, as essentially your your glass layer in which you can incorporate um, you know tens of atomic percent of metal within so effectively the glass layer forms um, a solid electrolyte when we impregnate this layer with uh, the super ionic region and in this case our glass layer that we were investigating was based on um, previous advances in this particular material that was um, a germanium selenide glass. Uh, certainly there are other glass compositions that could be used. Even uh, silicon dioxide was one that was uh, considered as, as one that could also form the, the foundational uh, base of, of this material. And then within this material, as I mentioned, you, you um, dope essentially, um, ionic rich regions. And in this case, we were using silver. Uh, copper is another good material that could be used um, for these base glass structures. And what happens is you, you create these super ionic regions that allow for um, um, mobile ionic transport through the glass. And so what this does is, you know, in, in its you know, off state or inert state, you have a very high resistivity material that acts as an insulator. And then when you're when you activate this super ionic region, uh, these silver ions that are in the glass start to form um, conductive silver metal. And so that's where we really saw some advantages in the sense that, you know, rather than in, for example, a FET based design or a solid state based design, where you're um, not forming a physical channel per se, you're creating a, a, a channel of, for electrons to flow uh, through through a semiconductive region. Um, you know, you're combining that with physical connections that that MEMS devices uh, have been known to show superior performance for because now you've got you know this physical metal connection. Um, but the advantage being that because it's an electronic process involving, you know, the um, uh, reduction of these ions in the silver of, of silver in this base glass, um, you know, you're you're combining the electronic processes of solid state devices now with with physical connections that MEMS allow uh, that MEMS are comparable to, and uh, avoiding a lot of the mechanical issues that that MEMS. Um, 
creates. You know, you don't have moving parts. You don't get, you know, stiction problems, which has been a known uh, issue with MEMS devices. And so this was kind of the impetus of why we were investigating this particular technology and looking at utilizing it in a way that could bring advantages um, across both the, the, the gap across solid state and MEMS-based approaches. Um, so in terms of fabrication processes, it's, it's, it is quite straightforward because um, effectively this um, chalcogenide glass material is, is what is the foundation of this switch. It is the switch. Um, it does require some, you know, has some unique requirements on the electrodes and the composition of those, but um, essentially you, you start with a substrate of, um, um, it could be a partially processed device, um, and then you begin by evaporating the, the base glass material onto that substrate, um, and then you follow that up with the evaporation of your metal ion that you're using. In our case, we're using silver. Uh, then you create the photo mask to define the region in which you want to create your switch. And so this photo mask blocks the UV radiation in the areas where you don't want the switch and the exposure of the silver to the um, UV light uh, is what causes this, this photo dissolution of the silver the silver becomes silver ions and begins to migrate into the glass material. And once you um, create that switch material area, you simply etch out the, the leftover silver and, and base glass that you, that you started with, and then apply a new mask to add the electrodes. And it's really as simple as that. Um, as I mentioned, the material itself uh, forms the basis of the switch in combination uh, with the um, unique aspects of the electrodes. And so if you go to the next chart, um, I'll talk through kind of the, the operation of this switch and the importance of, of the electrodes that, um, that are needed to, to implement this reversible switch action. Essentially, so the switch, though, is, you know, fundamentally um, this material, um, the, the electrodes play an important role in the operation of the switch. So um, at one end, one electrode uh, needs to be an oxidizable anode. And so in this case, uh, because we're using silver ions in the base glass, uh, this oxidizable anode in our case is a silver metal. And then we also have an inert cathode on the other end. Um, could be a variety of different metals. In our case, we were using nickel as the inert cathode. And as the these an, this anode and cathode uh, sits on top of this solid electrolyte, um, when in the off state, you know, there, it, it's a high resistance. Um, insulator between the two electrodes. And so we have no conduction of, of electricity through that. And then, so if we step to the next part of this animation, um, if it works, there we go. Um, oh, can we step back one, I think. Um, but effectively what you, what we have here is, is um, comparable to, um, you know, uh, um, like a lead acid battery type approach. We have a, a reduction oxidation reaction that takes place. And so when we apply a, a positive potential on the oxidizable anode relative to the inert cathode, um, we start oxidizing that anode and create additional silver ions that now uh, want to move through the solid electrolyte. And so we get local ionic motion within the electrolyte, um, which starts pushing silver ions towards the inert cathode where they become reduced and start forming a, um, a physical silver conducting bridge between the electrodes. And so you apply a voltage and a, you know, a set voltage and a set current. And if we go to the next part of this animation, uh, you see that this conducting um, 
nanowire bridge is formed between the anode and the cathode in 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 this case in nanoseconds and now we'll see that when we look at the data the um, the amount of time it takes to create these conductive bridges is uh, strictly dependent on the distance in which uh, these bridges need to form um, so that that's one aspect of the switch that um, um, you know, is really geometry base is, is the switching speed. Uh, so once this conducting link is formed, and for an example, um, if you were applying one volt of, of potential um, with say um, 100 milliamps of current, for example, um, that ratio is, uh, forms a resistive bridge. And in this case it'd be 10 ohms. And that, that bridge will con continue to grow until it reaches that equilibrium or that steady state. And then once that bridge is formed, it's there and the switch is, uh, stays on in this case. Um, and, you know, and it's, it's a non-volatile switch. So um, if you go to the next chart or next part of the animation, that bridge will stay after you take away the voltage that you're applying. And then to reverse the process, we simply re reverse the polarity across the electrodes, now applying a positive voltage on the inert cathode relative to the oxidizable anode. And then when we go to the next part of the animation, we see that the bridge starts to dissolve back into the solid electrolyte. The, um, the silver bridge is then, um, is oxidized to form the silver ions back within the base. And that process then uh, reverses itself also within that same amount of time in, in nanoseconds, if we're talking about nanometer type gaps uh, between the electrodes. And so if we go to the next part of that animation, you see then that um, in that same amount of time, the switch is now in the off state. And again, it's non-volatile, so it stays in that off state until the, um, the process is repeated. So if we can go to the next chart. Um, here I just have some data that we've col we collected on the performance of the switch. So, um, you know, the, the geometry of the switch is really going to be what defines the performance of the switch as well. Um, through uh, our investigations, um, you know, we we came across a, a design where we'd wanted to try to minimize the capacitance across this gap, which was why we have this transition from, um, you know, a, a standard 50 ohm type microstrip line down to a high impedance line um, so that the, we can get the capacitance across that gap down. Uh, to try to extend the, the frequency performance of this type of switch. And so based on the particular geometries that we were investigating, you know, our focus area was in this, this lower um, bands where, you know, Wi-Fi and, and things like that, their communication systems operate in, in these bands. And we saw very good um, um, uh, insertion loss, um, you know, on the order of half a dB or so when the switch was was turned on and then when we turned the switch off we saw relative relatively good isolation up to about six gigahertz uh of better than than 30 db now you know we we could extend beyond the frequency range that we tested but because as i mentioned you know the the capacitance is is really in this case what's going to limit the the frequency performance of of these type of devices and so because the impedance is, you know, goes by um, uh, one over uh, J omega C, C is the capacitance and omega is the frequency, um, you know, we, there's only so high in frequency we can go in this particular geometry, for example, uh, before that capacitance um, essentially looks like a, a conductive circuit anyway. So, um, so that's why we really were focusing on applications in, in the lower frequency bands. Um, but we saw through operation across these bands that uh, the linearity was extremely good um, because, you know, we were forming uh, a physical connection uh, between the two electrodes. Uh, in the, that lower left-hand corner of the kind of 
uh, micros microscope view of what was going on in that gap, you can see where these, uh, you know, conductive bridges were forming across that gap to, to create um, um, that closed switch case and, and, and operate in the on condition. Um, one of the issues, though, that we, we did identify in some of our early testing um, had to do with, with the repeatability of, of the switch performance. So, um, you know, we cycled the switch, you know, tens of times and each time we took another measurement and, you know, we did start to indicate loss of performance, um, you know, much sooner than we were anticipating. Um, we did some further investigations of that, came up with some uh, improved designs um, where, we, where we incorporated serrated edges into, into the gap uh between the two electrodes in that way we were we were um we were better at controlling where the highest electric fields uh existed and then we could we had a better job controlling the growth of of the, the silver bridges um, but certainly this is an area that um, is still under investigation today um, not not so much by our group but there has been additional research uh, conducted by other groups since we first um you know, demonstrated this technology that indicated uh, improved um, uh, cycling behavior, uh, you know, over 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 long term operation. But the uh, the other important thing to to address here, and I mentioned it before, had to do with the the switching speed. So um, the switching speed can be controlled by um, you know the amount of voltage and current you're applying to the switch. Um, you know, we were working, we were interested in low, lower power applications, lower voltage actuations. And so we, we, we tended to keep our um, experiments, you know, to one volt and below. And the average speed we, we measured based on those particular conditions was about one nanometer per nanosecond. And so um as a function of distance you know you can increase the distance uh between these electrodes uh to to gain some improvement in capacitive performance for example and and get higher frequency uh operation uh at the expense of slightly reduced speed in switching times um just by virtue of 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 the the trade space that exists between between all these elements and so um, optimizing of that, you know, could be done based on any, you know, particular application that, that, that you're interested in. Um, next chart. And so, um, I think, okay. Uh, so this is the summary of the kind of performance that we saw relative to the state of the art at the time with MEMS devices and solid state-based devices. Um, you know, certainly there was comparable performance in a lot of areas with with the the solid state based switches in terms of, for example, insertion loss. Uh, we saw, you know, better isolation uh, relative to to the state of the art in the, the solid state based switching approaches, not quite achieving uh, what MEMS can get in those areas. Uh, certainly the, the frequency range uh, was uh, limited relative to the other applications. Uh, and again, that was, as I mentioned, based on the geometry of the switch that, that we were uh, working with. Um, the switching speed was kind of right in that sweet spot, again, based on the geometry of the switch we were working with uh, between MEMS base and solid state based approaches. Uh, the life cycle, as I mentioned, we didn't have the opportunity to fully uh, uh, investigate and, and improve upon that. So that that's certainly an area that that I believe uh, could use some additional characterization and development. Uh, but in terms of size and cost, um, you know, we were outperforming uh, MEMS based and solid state based approaches. Um, what I want to you know, point out and what I have circled here is, you know, really where we saw significant um, advantages uh, with the, this nanoionic based type of switch versus MEMS and, and solid state switches were, were in the voltages in which we were required uh, to use to activate the switch. 
and as well as the the energy consumption so um energy consumption speaks to the fact that um because it's a non-volatile switch you know you apply um, more power than you would for example on a mems device mems devices require very high voltages uh, in order to to close the, their their mechanical switch process um we were and and we were at uh voltages you know within a volt or or lower that we were we were able to to operate this um and then once as i said once the switch was was either turned on or off um particularly in the on state uh there was no additional power or energy needed to to maintain that state owing to the non-volatile nature and so th those two aspects were really kind of what we were honing in on as areas in which um you know we could identify some novel applications for this particular type of uh, switch technology um so we can go to the next chart And I think this is uh, might be the slightly different version, but it's not a problem. Um, so I, I did have a chart, um, but I can speak to it uh, on the the different type of various applications of of switch technology. So as I mentioned, uh, tunable and reconfigurable RF devices is is definitely a, a, a key area for for RF based switches. Um, there's been some developments, for example. Um, utilizing this type of approach uh, with this nano-ionic switch in, in components such as tunable inductors, um, tunable capacitors. I mentioned the phase shifting technology that we were primarily interested in, um, as well as the, the reconfigurable antenna technologies. Um, but what, what really, you know, I believe makes this switch, um, you know, have a, um, Add critical value has to do with with two key aspects of of its design. So, um, the simplicity of the fabrication process uh, really allows for these unique type of switch geometries. And so, you know, in in this this cartoon here on the upper right, um, you know, we we could see one kind of imagination of of how we could incorporate the switch into single pole and throw type uh phase shifting devices um in this case the the switch itself is really as i mentioned the material and the the electrodes that that make it up and so as as a material based switch um you know you can deposit this material in in any sorts of in any sort of geometries that that you would like to create your uh switching mechanism um and and allow it to operate you know based on the fact that you just have the dissimilar metals for your anode and cathode in order to function and so you can take in this case you know if we if we look at kind of the planar geometry where we have labeled one two and three um, a single pole end throw switch could be could be controlled um, with just essentially end control lines so we don't need you know, separate pairs of control lines for each particular switch. In this case, we have a common um, um, voltage applied to, you know, the, the common node. And then we just need N control lines uh, in order to direct where we want that switch or those, these conductive bridges to grow uh, to connect various um, delay lines, for example. Um, the other aspect of, of be owing to the simple fabrication of this uh, switch had to do with with vias as well. So, um, you know, this material, uh, which is, you know, the base glass with the with the photo dissolved silver ions in it uh, could also be uh, fabricated through vias as well. And this was demonstrated in, in other applications. Uh, but through these vias now, we can we can start considering multi-layer switch geometries. And so instead of just switching on a, on a particular plane, you can go up and down, for example, and create more compact, you know, lower footprint type designs uh, by incorporating multiple layers um, with, with this very simple switching approach. 
So uh, this was one area we, we felt was uh, of um, an advantage to, to leveraging this type of technology. Uh, the other area that we were also investigating had to do with the, you know, the non-volatile operation and the low voltage operation. And so um, we had some interest in this technology from um, the automotive industry. Uh, they kind of spurred actually some of the, the the concepts that we developed following the initial development of this switch, where they they mentioned that you know the the wiring in 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 their vehicles were kind of a a, a a point of failure for a lot of their systems, and so we were imagining could we leverage this type of switch technology um, without wires? Um, could we wirelessly control these switches? And because you know it, it's it's relatively uh, low voltage requirement to to operate the switch, um, we also imagined an application in which you could incorporate, for example, an electrically small antenna uh, with a with some type of rectifying diode um, that converts that electromagnetic energy into a a uh, low voltage, which is relatively straightforward to do. And through that type of circuit, now you could wirelessly activate, you know, maybe it's through some some secondary antenna system could be a handheld system um, that allows you to, um, um, you know, utilize, for example, a particular frequency to turn a switch on and a separate frequency to turn it off or or it could be incorporated into a, a common wireless system uh, that alternates between uh, voltage polarities when you apply uh, a wireless signal in order to, to operate the switch. And so um, one application that we were looking at in, in this regard, for example, had to do with uh, you know, RFIDs. And so in this way, we could feasibly take you know, these very cheap um, you know RFIDs and incorporate this type of switching technology in order to effectively reprogram uh, these RFID systems uh, for other purposes, um, whatever they may be. Uh, you could wireless, wirelessly control and and program RFIDs um, if we were able, if we're able to incorporate this switch technology in in those designs. So this was another area that we. Um, thought would, would, would be very valuable in terms of a novel application uh, owing to the, the non-volatile nature, right? So you would apply that frequency, um, the switch would change state, and um, you would no longer need to continue applying some sort of uh, impulse or, or frequency in order to maintain it in that way. And so I think we have the next chart is just... Um, kind of summarizing some of my concluding remarks here. Um, so, you know, this electrical chemical, this electrochemical switch technology, uh, whereas it didn't, you know, allow us to have our cake and eat it too, in terms of um, outperforming uh, MEMS and solid state devices in all areas, um, it did lead us down uh, a path that allowed us to identify some unique applications of, of this particular type of switch. Um, that uh, are made possible through its uh, non-volatile nature and the lack of restriction on any type of specific planar type of geometry in order to integrate. Um, again, it's extremely simple to fabricate and the fabrication process can be done in, in existing, uh, you know, using existing clean room technologies today. Um, leveraging standard silicon manufacturing uh, equipment. Um, it is still, you know, relatively low in its technology readiness level. Uh, so, you know, there is still some further testing and development necessary to, to realize this for, you know, any type of mass production uh, applications. Um, but certainly since we initiated and, and published on this work, there have been other groups that uh, have continued to um, mature and develop it further um, and shown, shown some improvement in results um, based on our initial testing. And then in my mind, kind of the, the key area that, that really probably needs to be focused on is, is looking at improvements of this mean time before failure. So trying to um, um, 
perform some additional uh, characterization development uh, in order to um, ensure that we're approaching uh, those kind of long life cycling times that that switches need to 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 operate with. Um, certainly, there may be other applications where you don't need um, you know billions of of switching. Um, um, uh, processes to to function. Uh, for example, like with with RFIDs, it might be a little more straightforward. You don't need to switch it so many times. Um, but this is also, you know, an area that we um, see as something that we want to uh, further investigate. So, um, I believe that's what I had uh, for my presentation. So I'll hand it off to Renee to talk tech transfer.